Welcome, everybody, to the New Liar podcast. I'm here with our guest, Matthew Arrett, who is back to talk to us about a new article that he's published and to discuss a subject which I think is going to be somewhat uh, a very complex uh, question and which, interestingly enough, we'll see is discussed in fiction in some very popular works of fiction uh, by H.G. Wells, uh, among others. And it's going to be a strange topic, and it's going to be a strange show. So I'm going to warn everybody now. Uh, Matthew Arrett is a journalist for the Strategic Culture Foundation. He's the co-founder of the Rising Tide Foundation, which is dedicated to intercultural dialogue, uh, you know, historical... Uh, research, and all sorts of uh, cultural studies and, and studies in how we can really, I mean, basically, Matthew, you're excited about the idea of creating a new cultural renaissance, right? And you want it to be a renaissance in universal culture. Is that right? Is, is that I? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that's where we... Uh... We tend to uh, <clears throat> move in the same sort of kindred spirit orientation that we both see and feel that humankind is, is much better than what we see around us day to day when we turn on the news and that there's something in every great culture which is beautiful in their music and their poetry and their, their architecture and in, their, in, in science, which if we focus on those things, we will have a much better platform for peace you know, the, these utopian ideas people say are just like imaginary, like peace on earth, goodwill towards men. I think that that's actually a practical goal to, to have. It's not just for uh, stupid kids who are naive or something for t parents to tell their kids so that they, they go to sleep at night and not, not cry about the destruction of Africa or something. Um, so, yeah, that's the Rising Tide Foundation is really uh, designed to express and explore um, those characteristics of human aesthetics and history and culture and create a, a real excitement around ideas that are universal. Okay, I mean, we have a very difficult subject. I mean, this is a complex subject that we're gonna be yeah. talking about. We haven't even really named it yet, um, but it's because you talked about beautiful ideas and uh, you know the idea of, of, of beauty and its importance. Yeah. I think many people listening right now, um, there's a lot of things going on in the world which might lead us to believe that the world is not as beautiful as it is, you know, might be made out to be by some of these, you know, some of the greatest artists, for example, or, you know, if we read the works of somebody like Friedrich Schiller, hmm. or, uh, you know, this, the optimism of something like a Dante, or <clears throat> even Keats and Shelley, right? Uh, Shakespeare in his own way, as he explores all the complexities, you know, what of piece of work man is right it's a complex question but that's really the only way we're not talking about a superficial idea of beauty here that oh everything is just so beautiful at the surface level and we don't really have to think or anything right it's just it's just this romantic idealized beauty um and i think that's what people might accuse somebody like yourself you know if we read uh, a lot of the work on rising tide the Rising Tide Foundation, <clears throat> I mean, you're very optimistic. And we're going to be talking about, in a sense, um, some very ugly ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what's going to make the discussion more interesting, because in a sense, we're talking about art and the crucial role that art plays in the development of a society, in the shaping, not of what human beings think as such, but how they think. Right. And we're going to be talking about H.G. Wells, who really understood the power of storytelling. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this goes back to ancient Greece. Right. The mythos. Right. And this whole culture of storytelling and, and tragedy and how that shapes the way people think at a much higher level than just, you know, how, you know, day to day rationalizing and calculating and, you know, sort of getting through uh, the mundane uh, workings of every day. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a very serious subject. And you specifically in your article, uh, among, I mean, you've written many articles on all sorts of subjects, 
but uh, you wrote about H.G. Wells and the time machine. And you talked about some of the ideas that he advances there. So, I mean, why don't we start about that? What, what's, what's the time machine about? What's... The time machine was the first, um, the first short story, not short story, it was the first fiction book published by H.G. Wells in 1893 when his career was just beginning. Um, it's a story which really is, is recognized as a pioneering work because it, it created the, the template in many ways that shaped much of or the majority of the, um, the science fiction writers of the 20th century and into the first couple of decades here of the 21st century. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's something which I had always enjoyed growing up. I'd, I'd encountered this, the storyline, you know, watching a movie version when I was younger. And, and it's just, it's a very, it's a very strongly felt film. Um, the story itself takes place uh, at different points in the future. There's a, a, an individual within the story who develops a time machine, as the name implies, and uh, finds himself 800,000 years, nearly a million years into the future. And discovers very quickly that in this world, which just has these residues of uh, a past civilization, um, humanity has split off into two evolutionary groups. Uh, two species have differentiated. Um, and he first encounters these um, sort of dim-witted, simple-minded, uh, beautiful LOI uh, walking on the top under the sun. And they live in a very, you know, peasant, simplistic life. Um, you still have, again, like some industrial relics and echoes from the past, uh, but nothing really active there. Mm. Um, but then something else happens, and there's another branch of civilization that shows up at night. So there's like these evening raids. Uh, and what happens is that the underground creatures who control all of the industrial output, the, the machinery, the gears that keep things going, occasionally move above ground for raids where they kidnap various LOI and bring them down and ultimately cannibalize them um, as their food source. <clears throat> so um, this, this individual goes through a series of adventures uh, throughout the, the play or the, 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 the story and uh, finds himself, you know, different flung off, you know, up to millions and millions of years into the future, billions of years even. And uh, throughout this whole thing, certain discoveries of, are made that are, are somewhat depressing and he, ultimately ends the story. I, I don't want to blow too much, but ultimately he ends up back a few hours uh, after he had originally departed um, with only a few little signs that this actually happened, uh, a few little artifacts in his, uh, in his coat pocket. So that's, that's all. Right. I mean, okay. There, I mean, there's a lot that can be, there is a lot that needs to be said because HG Wells talks a lot about technology. He talks a lot about scientific progress mm -hmm. and, he talks a lot about human creativity. And this is a subject that I think then that, that we're, we're all very passionate about uh, at New Liar and our contributors at The Chain Views, uh, which is also another website uh, that I edit. And I mean, how to say this, if we look at the kinds of problems that H.G. Wells is addressing in his fiction, I think there's a lot of, um, or let's put it this way, H.G. Wells understands the question of creativity. He understands the nature of human progress, but he has a problem with it. And his main problem is the question of overpopulation. Mm. He, and many of the thinkers around his time, many of his, uh, I mean, colleagues, friends, Bertrand Russell, uh, George Bernard Shaw, these types, uh, they were, uh, Algis Huxley, the danger of population growth as a cause, as, as, a, as a result of scientific progress and creative development is something that concerned him. And so we see that in a lot of his fiction, H.G. Time Machine being only one, right? He's recognizing this creative potential in humanity, but then he does something that most people probably don't, if they're just reading it as fiction, they're not really going to catch what he's, he's really doing. Yeah. And I think in a lot of cases, a lot less people have read his works of nonfiction, which is a response to the kind of problems that he's, he's outlining uh, in fantasies. 
So last podcast, we had uh, Professor Pascal Chevrier who was on, and we discussed the, the story of Prometheus, right, as told by Aeschylus. And I think it's worthwhile to bring it back today because H.G. Wells also <clears throat> essentially identifies the same principle. And so I think it'd be important to make a counterpoint between the two different kinds of uh, approaches or treatment of the same question. And I mean, as far as art goes, and as far as thinking goes, when we're, we're looking at great classical art, the idea really lies in how the author decides to treat his subject. You know, creativity is a thing, but is it good? Is it bad? We find that in H.G. Wells, creativity is this thing that is innate within human beings, but he's also very, um, he's also a very ardent proponent of finding a way to control this. And in Prometheus, this, this thing, creativity, is knowledge of fire. So before we go any further, I think it's important to just uh, give a bit of context for what we're really talking about. And I just want everybody to compare the two passages. I mean, these are thousands of years apart. And yet both these authors are homing in on something, which is, I think, I mean, lies at the heart of the question of human nature of, you know, when we're talking about art and what art is really expressing um, at, at its most fundamental level, it, we're, we're, we're talking about an image of human beings. And what is this image? So this is from Prometheus Bound, which is written by Aeschylus, one of the great Greek tragedians. Prometheus <clears throat> at one point says, but listen to the tale of human sufferings and how at first senseless as beast, I gave men sense, possess them of mind. I speak not in contempt of man. I do but tell of good gifts I conferred in the beginning, seeing they saw amiss and hearing heard not, but like phantoms huddled in dreams, the perplexed story of their days confounded, knowing neither timber work nor brick built dwellings basking in the light, but dug for themselves holes wherein like ants that hardly may contend against a breath, they dwelt in burrows of their unsunned caves. Neither of winter's cold had they fixed sign, nor of the spring when she comes decked with flowers, nor yet of summer's heat with melting fruits, sure token, but utterly without knowledge, moiled, until I the rising of the stars showed them, and when they set, though much obscure. Moreover number, the most excellent of all inventions, I for them devised, and gave them writing that retaineth all, the serviceable mother of the muse. I was the first that yoked unmanaged beasts to serve as slaves with collar and with pack, and take upon themselves, to man's relief, the heaviest labor of his hands, and tamed to the rein and drove in wheeled cars the horse of sumptuous pride, the ornament and those sea wanderers with the wings of cloth, the shipmen's wagons, none but I contrived. These manifold inventions for mankind I perfected, who out upon it have none, no, not one shift to rid me of this shame. So this is the story of Prometheus, which um, I mean, maybe Matt, you might just, uh, summarize the whole battle between Zeus and Prometheus, right? What's Prometheus is in the middle of something here as he's defining what he's really given the human species. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think your audience is probably aware, but I, I could, I could just quickly summarize uh, the, the, the context of, of this uh, citation that you just read um, in, in the world that Aeschylus is painting uh, a law is absolute that cannot be um, broken which is that mankind is, is, must remain ignorant to the, the skills and the sciences that only the gods may have access to of Olympus. And so Zeus has basically threatened anybody who uh, gives fire to mankind. Um, and Aeschylus is very clear, as, as you've read in that story, that fire is, comes with, com which comes with it is mineralogy, uh, chariot, being able to control animals, animal husbandry, uh, mathematics, the stars, the poetry. 
all of this stuff. So fire is not just simply fire, though it is fire. Um, but the use of it uh, is also the awakening of something within this internal fire of the soul that awakens uh, something that the material part of us, you wouldn't guess if we were, if you were just looking at us and the chimpanzee like aspects of our physical being, which has a lot of similarities to, to monkeys living in, you know, in the mud and uh, in caves in the dark, um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't imagine. So Prometheus goes and betrays Zeus. He, he, uh, he disobeys the law. And while Zeus is in a, a drunken stupor, as he often is, the, the degenerate uh, steals fire and, um, and gives it to man uh, with all of those other, other skill sets. And he's punished by being tied, chained to a rock where he is going to be punished with uh, having his liver eaten out every day for 10,000 years. Unless, of course, he renounces uh, what he did, apologizes to Zeus, and tells Zeus what he knows about the future. And mm -hmm. Prometheus is somebody who is also has insight into the future as one of his skill sets that I think are something that anybody who properly wields their, their internal fire has increasing access to, foresight, uh, where Zeus wants to know, how am I going to be under, under taken down? Um, and then, you know, he'll, he'll help him, he will release him if he, if he tells him how he's going to be taken down. And in spite of that, um, Prometheus, in defiance, uh, chooses to st stick his ground and, and accept the pain physically, knowing that there's a higher justice. And it's a really beautiful, um, it's, it's only one of, of three parts. The other two have been lost to the sands of time. However, um, the lessons in it are really key. And, and like you said, there's something that both Aeschylus understands that this story, I mean, really goes on to shape the entire, not only ethics, but the idea of self-organization of the ancient Greek society that, you know, people often forget that the ancient Greeks didn't see fiction and storytelling and myth making the way we see cinema or, you know, reading a, a novel to, to relax. It wasn't seen as just simply entertainment. It was really more sacred and the entire society had tuned itself to accommodate and uh, it's, it's self-organization based on the stories of its storytellers right. for good or for bad. And, and so a lot of the same insights into human nature that distinguishes us from animals um, is, is also contained in the mind and in the writings you'll find uh, of H.G. Wells, the similar awareness, at least on a, on that intellectual level and, and the similar sense of understanding the importance of this differentiating characteristic of this Promethean firebringer quality. So that's there. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. There's, I mean, there's a lot right there because number one, Prometheus thinks fire is worth fighting for. Okay. Knowledge of fire is worth fighting for and defending the human species. Mm -hmm. Zeus, you just said that this knowledge of fire, this, this creative fire is really what sets human beings apart from beasts. That would, that's what Prometheus states as well. Mm -hmm. And so Zeus wants to deny this. He mm -hmm. wants to deny this essential principle of fire. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we talked about that in the last podcast, you know, because there's a lot of art today, which is just about entertainment. You know, there's Netflix, there's Amazon. And I mean, if you have a choice, okay, you're going to have to fight for knowledge of fire, not just for yourself, but for others, right? If there is a Zeusian, you know, I, I mean, in many ways, there are parallels between the kind of Zeusian system we see in Prometheus and still today in many parts of the world. Right. There's this idea of trying to suppress whether especially uh, recently, right, to suppress free speech in all sorts of different ways or to suppress, um, I mean, all sorts of knowledge or all sorts of opinions or all sorts of ideas. And. I mean, this is the oligarchical system that Prometheus is going against. So the question is today, you know, if people have a choice between all the entertainment there's this, this brave new world system that's set up. Or they can fight for fire. Zeus is going to give them all sorts of problems. Uh, you know, they're going to have all sorts of people coming after them. Uh, if they're really fighting for knowledge of fire, I mean, is it worth it? You're going to go through all this trouble or you can just kind of live your best life. You know, enjoy all the many fancies and, 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 and pleasures and, and delights and entertainment that this, you know, world has to offer you know why fight for knowledge of fire i mean it's a bit of a hard sell yeah. for a lot of people yeah and i mean 
so why fight for it? That's, I, I think that's, okay, now we found the question. I mean, this is really the, why should we fight for that? You know, for me, uh, this was outlined uh, thousands of years ago. And this, that, that there was a fight between this, all an oligarchical type system we've seen throughout history and another system which has this view of human beings as creative, right? As willfully creative, as self-consciously, as self-conscious creators, co-creators, right? And that this is obviously a threat if you want to have an established fixed system, right? A, a sort of uh, a fixed rule that you want to impose on the mass of people. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, let's just compare what... Aeschylus laid out in his Prometheus, which let's zoom, like H.G. Wells says, we're going to zoom into the future, thousands of years into the future. And here's what H.G. Wells writes in The World Set Free. The history of mankind is the history of the attainment of external power. Man is the tool using, fire making enemy. From the outset of his terrestrial career, we find him supplementing the natural strength and bodily weapons of a beast by the heat of burning and the rough implement of stone. So he passed beyond the ape. From that, he expands. Presently, he added to himself the power of the horse and the ox. He borrowed the carrying strength of water and the driving force of the wind. He quickened his fire by blowing and his simple tools pointed first with copper and then with iron, increased and varied and became more elaborate and efficient. He sheltered his heat in houses and made his way easier by paths and roads. He complicated his social relationships and increased his efficiency by the division of labor. He began to store up knowledge, contrivance followed contrivance, each making it possible for a man to do more. Always down the lengthening record, save for a setback ever and again. He is doing more. A quarter of a million years ago, the utmost man was a savage, a being scarcely articulate, sheltering in holes in the rocks, armed with a rough-hewn flint or a fire-pointed stick, naked, living in small family groups, killed by some younger man so soon as his first virile activity declined. Over most of the great wildernesses of Earth, you would have sought him in vain, only in a few temperate and subtropical river valleys would you have found the squatting lairs of his little herds, a male, a few females, a child or so. He knew no future then, no kind of life except the life he led. He fled the cave bear over the rocks full of iron ore and the promise of sword and spear. He froze to death upon a ledge of coal. He drank water muddy with clay that would one day make cups of porcelain. He chewed the ear of wild wheat he had plucked and gazed with a dim speculation in his eyes at the birds that soared beyond his reach. Or suddenly he became aware of the scent of another male and rose up roaring, his roars the formless precursors of moral admonitions. For he was a great individualist, that original. He suffered none other than himself. So through the long generations, this heavy precursor, the ancestor of all of us, fought and bred and perished, changing almost imperceptibly. Yet he changed. That keen chisel of necessity which sharpened the tiger's claw, age by age, and fine down the clumsy orifice to the swift grace of the horse, was at work upon him, is at work upon him still. The clumsy and more stupidly Fierce among him were killed soonest and oftenest. The finer hand, the quicker eye, the bigger brain, the better balanced body prevailed. Age by age, the implements were a little better made, the man a little more delicately adjusted to his possibilities. He became more social, his herd grew. And he goes on. But he lays out the essential, the same principle. I think what's important is that he starts off with the same principle in the world set free. The history of mankind is the history of attainment of external power. Man is the tool using fire making animal. Mm -hmm. So the question is how does, Wells recognizes this and 
if we read his fiction, all his different works, we see him treating this question differently. And what, what happens as human beings progress, the human species progresses and attains further knowledge of this fire? What does it look like? And what is it, what, what will the future look like? I mean, I, I just to make clear that if people think this is just fiction, I mean, this is just entertainment. No, Wells is developing an idea. Yeah. And there's a question when we're dealing with this kind of serious art, is it true? Is, is his vision that he's going to outline as something like in the time machine uh, or in the world, is it true? Yeah. Is the vision laid out in Prometheus, bound, is that true? What, what does it mean? Yeah, exactly. I, uh, <clears throat> no, I think that uh, when, you, when you look at the actual fiction and also hold in mind the nonfiction, bountiful nonfiction writings as well, um, keeping in also mind that he wasn't just somebody sitting in a, in a study uh, making money off of his books. He was out there applying um, as part of um, a grouping of people throughout his life. Uh, he had collaborators. You, you brought up earlier on uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, George Bernard Shaw. Um, there were many others in these upper crust British networks um, who were very, very devoutly of the view that human beings should be organized in a certain way under and organized by a certain uh, ethical structure, a certain paradigm. Um, <clears throat> And so you will, you have to always hold these different aspects of his being, what he was, what he, what he lived for, how he saw himself as useful in something greater in, in mind when you're reading through his works, whether it's, um, uh, whether it's, it's the invisible man where a scientist discovers the key for invisibility scientifically. And it's, it's really wrapped in a lot of scientific language with some strong hypotheses on, you know, if it was going to be done, it would work this way or war of the worlds, you know, with Mars invasions attacking us and wiping out humankind um, right. until a, until a, a germ um, gets them, they catch cold and all die or, uh, or things to come or, or, or uh, you know, earth's or, or the world set free. Um, whatever the case, whatever is fiction book. Yeah. You always have to look, okay, how is it? What are the, what are the underlying ideas the 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 lessons that he wants his audience to walk away with even if it's not explicit you'll you'll find that there's certain constants that are very much in tune with what he says in his open conspiracy uh, book in 1929 or his mm -hmm. new world order book from 1940 or any of his uh you know experiment experiments in autobiography and other things his anticipations you'll find like very similar uh, universal constants that he wants um that he believes in and, um, you know, what you just read regarding um, how he opens with identifying human beings as the tool making, fire making, using uh, species, there's a few hints in, t in the problem that you don't have with Aeschylus. And it's really good to do these comparative studies a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Because on the one hand, he's, you know, his assumptions come out, his, uh, his misanthropy, his disdain for humankind comes out even though he's trying to clothe himself um, publicly as somebody who likes humankind, right? He tries mm -hmm. to do that. And that's how a lot of people think of him and like him. Um, and one of the things he says here is like the precursors of our future moral premonitions, right? Where does he say in that little ex extract you read, where does he say they arise from us early on <laughs> smelling some male competitor in our environment that induces a roar of rage, right? Mm -hmm. Like you see in the animal species. Right. And he immediately follows it up with that that creates and establishes the precursors for our later moral premonitions. Um, mm. That's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. Um, and he describes, you know, later on in, in what you wrote that the over time, the weaker of the species is killed off in the struggle for survival in a world of dimin diminishing returns by the stronger, the quicker, the more fit. Very, very materialistic uh, uh, Darwinian radical Darwinian interpretations of human mm -hmm. nature that completely neglects some of the keys that what makes Aeschylus's insight into humanity so profound. And if you also look at somebody who came a little after Aeschylus, um, I think offers a lot of really great insight into resolving this problem is somebody who, who self-described themselves in their dialogues, Plato, as a Promethean. Plato says, I am a Promethean type. 
That's how I identify myself. And he, he says that in the Protagoras dialogue and in several other dialogues. What does he mean? What is he talking about? Right. Um, and I, I think this is what is clear. I just reread the Prometheus dialogue when you, uh, uh, Aeschylus is Prometheus bound when you, when you told me about your idea for our, our dialogue. And I was shocked to, I, that I didn't quite capture my attention the first few times I'd read it. But what does Prometheus say his motivation is uh, for stealing fire and, and sustaining the, the torture from Zeus, the wrath? Mm. What, what, do you remember what he says his motive was? Uh, no. Twice, he says in the course of it, it is the love of mankind that drove me to do this. Mm, mm, right, yes, yes, yes. And again, you see this come back again in um, uh, Socrates' uh, soliloquy in Plato's Symposium Dialogue, where each person standing up at this drinking party is expressing different uh, hypotheses of what love is, because the word gets off the abused and nobody's really ever quite... Uh, had a had a proper investigation scientifically of what real love is and differentiate it from lower orders of love. So right. you know, Plato creates the drinking party opportunity where each person has a beautiful uh, exposition of their idea. Each one having certain problems with it that you know it tests your your critical thinking. Like where where did it go wrong there? But it's there's but he's also embedding truths in each one too. And then when Socrates gets up, he has his. Uh, praise to love, which is probably the most rigorously solid of, of all of them. Mm -hmm. um, you also have it repeated a little a few generations later in um, by the writings of Paul in First Corinthians 13, right? That, you know, doesn't matter what type, wh what I have, whether I, I, I speak with the tongues of angels, but if I have not love, it doesn't, it's like clanging symbols. It, it right. doesn't matter if I do all of these good works. It's okay. all empty if it's not being motivated by love. So in the case of creative, your creative offerings, um, I would say if you if you look at H.G. Wells, that is a characteristic that he has never been able to tap into in, in, in his own heart. And I think you, you might want to say something later on about what might have caused that as a young man growing up in, a, in, in, in England. But also you, you'll find it completely absent in his Promethean characters. So he has characters in his stories who um, love science they 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 or not love science but they they really really like science a lot and they're they're committed and obsessed with stopping wars and applying science to benefit humankind into these future scenarios that he generates in the things to come in the world set free right. seemingly beautiful utopian worlds but there's something always lacking in his protagonists uh, right well, okay, so I mean, hang on, because I, I can hear H.G. Wells, if he's chiming in or, or, or based on his works, right, what's going to be his response to what uh, you're saying here? And he's really, he, he's going to shut you down really fast, because, okay, you're talking about this love for humankind, uh, you know, agape, as some call it, and this divine creative spark within human beings that everybody has. He's like, sure, okay, great, you have that. But in the world set free, that's the same principle, right? The, the discovery of radium and atomic energy, which allows for the creation of nuclear bombs. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that uh, this is before the nuclear bomb. And uh, as it, it's a fact that Leo Zillard, who actually came up with the first sustained uh, nuclear chain reaction that could be used to create a bomb, he got his idea from Wells and he was inspired by Wells. But what was Wells' idea in a world set free? Yeah, man has knowledge of fire, but he built atomic bombs with it. And guess what? He said these bombs are even strange to the most advanced and creative human beings. They were deeply strange because you have these uh, continuous sustained atomic reaction bombs, cities burning up for days on end, because it's a fusion reaction. So it's continuing and it's continuing. And this is knowledge of fire too, my friend. Mm -hmm. And so HD, you know, he's, he's making fire look pretty bad, isn't he? He is. And I think this is where the Socrates Windig principle comes in because Socrates, you know, he, he has this really fun uh, example of uh, how he sees himself as a midwife. That, and, and this is a really great thing to keep for, in mind for teachers today who might be listening is that, you know, the, the, the two different ways of thinking about teaching is either to 
put things in the heads of your student, right? Get them to memorize and you see it sort of like a vessel to be filled with stuff and get them, get their mm -hmm. behaviors to change according to reward and punishment, uh, in a, you know, according to certain social standards that will make them successful or get a job in, you know, whatever field. That's one approach or Socrates approach is the midwife idea of, of, of having the concept that it's already there inside of the, the mind and soul of the student and the proper teacher should ask questions and, and help the student um, learn how to think about thinking, think about where it is their, their, their understanding break down and generate a new hypothesis, uh, conceive a new hypothesis, which is where the word midwife came from. He's helping people give birth to ideas. And also he said, additionally, um, I, I also can identify what is a, um, a stillbirth, uh, what he calls a wind egg versus a genuine uh, baby that should be prized and celebrated when somebody gives birth to one. Because yeah. a wind egg, um, you know, it, the name as it applies is like something that looks like an egg and an egg implies fertility, but when, there's only wind in it. So there are certain types of sets of ideas that have the, the image, they masquerade as the truth. But when you start really poking them and examining them, you discover that there's no truth in them. Right. Um, and this has been a technique by him going through this. He sort of exposed something which empires have used to keep their victims self-deluding and self-controlling for a very long time. Because empires don't control their victims by force for the most part. Um, that's not how the British were able to control India, a population of 300 million for generations. You know, with the British soldiers there is maybe a force of 20,000. Um, proportionally, their power was almost nothing compared to the Indian physical power. So what it was, was a recognition of where are the weaknesses in thinking of the culture you want to exploit and subvert and capitalize on those by giving across images of truth. Wells is somebody who, I mean, I think that he's living at a time where um, you have a real Promethean, for example. Just to clarify, um, because his solution, just to mention what his actual solution, because we, we defined the, he talks about this problem, but he, he gives a solution. I mean, we can, I think it's, we may as well just mention it, right? So he says sure. we need world government, right? We yeah. need okay. a regulatory body to basically um, manage knowledge of fire. That knowledge of fire is dangerous and you can't, it can't just be yeah. ubiquitous in society. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and one of the, the, um, the key figures who's the most benevolent of his future age uh, is who, of a post nation state order is the king of England, this fictional king who abdicates his throne for this world government. And there's yeah. some other governments who resist and say, no, we want to save the sovereign nation state powers. Sure, yeah. They're like the moral lesson for the readers. These are the ignorant ones you want to look down on. And ultimately a, a better world uh, in, in the world set free. That was 1914, right? Right before world war one really kicked up, kicked off. Um, the, 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 the world that emerged under world government was a world of peace. It's a world that you'd kind of want to have where the majority of people are enjoying the fruits of technology of the, of the atom finally being harnessed for the good for, for all of our productive needs so that people are mostly artists or poets in that society. It sounds all nice. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's a, one of the key uh, figures, this guy, Marcus Karenin, who is a, uh, a lead character in the story. By the very end, he's an old man now, you know, and he's having a dialogue with a few younger people about the nature of man. This is now after society is mostly free. And what's it all about? What is the purpose of life now that we've achieved seeming peace on earth, world government, society run by experts, everyone's a poet. Um, and the question of love comes in. And uh, this one young person is saying, but isn't love really what is going to be motivating us now that we, we can all be poets? And, and the, the hero of the story, Marcus uh, Karenin, is saying, well, no, no, that, that's foolish. Because love, and first of all, he defines it in a very erotic way. Mm. Love, which is the, the wellspring of all creative passion, he says. It, mm. it is true that that is what gives birth to, to creative discoveries, he says, is love. But he defines it as erotic love, right? And he says the higher love, the, the, the higher motive for existence is not going to be love. That's naive. You're just saying that because you're young. You're not old like me who can't have sex anymore. You know, that's basically implicitly what he's saying. Um, he says it's really knowledge and power, knowledge and power. Mm -hmm. And he goes through a very cold sort of utilitarian Kantian ethic that that is what is going to uh, uh, ultimately be the important forces. And love is not that is actually an illusion. Now, he doesn't identify uh, the higher agopic love that Aeschylus was motivated by or that Plato talks about. 
he actually yeah. doesn't ever identify that as even existing to begin with in his works. Um, and if he does, it's always delusional. It's always somebody who's completely insane and usually causes a war. Um, so mm. this is the Windig thing, right? Where he's taken the behavior, the good behavior of somebody you would want to have in society as a leader, uh, causing technology to be used for our benefit. That's all fine. But the thing that allows for that behavior to have any justifiable meaning or to be good that that first Corinthians talks about, you know, no matter how many good works I do, if I have not love, it is nothing. Um, mm -hmm. That's true. That that's lot. And that's why um, Jules Verne is a, a character I was going to say, I think is a Promethean science fiction writer who whose life overlapped that of H.G. Wells. But if you read some of Jules Verne's works, the French, uh, the French author, uh, you find a completely different, truly Promethean expression of creative science fiction, whether it's the earth to the moon or whether it's journey to the center of the earth or whether it's journey around uh, uh, 80 days around the world. All of them do something totally different where they also talk about the future. They talk about technology. They talk about humankind, human nature, uh, Promethean fire wielding, like all of those characteristics in, in the formula are, are also there in Jules Verne, except the difference is Jules Verne loves mankind and his understanding of that love of himself is embedded in the individuals in his scenarios that awakens that same feeling and potentials in the, the readers of his works right. as well. That's what H.G. Wells was snuffing out. So yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, as I hear you speaking and I hear that, and I'm, I'm thinking about people who perhaps already have, you know, a pessimistic outlook on the world, like right now in the world, there are some very, um, there's a very cynical idea of, of human nature. Yeah. And I mean, especially when it comes to discussions of uh, human beings and the environment, right? There's the idea that really, I mean, at its best, human beings need to be living in this equilibrium with nature. They are just another species among many other species on the planet. Mm. And the earth is this very pristine, fragile, and fixed system that we can't change. We, we have to make sure we don't walk the boat or make any waves and throw off that balance, right? Yeah. Which is what we're, you know, a lot of people would say we're doing right now. And that it's worse. I mean, human existence, and H.G. Wells talks about this, uh, human existence is really like a cancerous growth. It's a plague on the world. Mm -hmm. um, because we're just, there's a population growth and there's progress and we're just dirty industry. And he describes, and I, I think this is worth probably reading because maybe people can relate to this. And I, I think it's important to, there's a lot, there's a lot of emotion involved in these questions. These are not just ideas, uh, or I mean, these are not just rational questions and the art is playing on those emotions as well, right? It's, it's appealing. You're talking about love for humankind. I mean, that's a hard sell today, I think, for a lot of people because they've been so, there's this view that human beings, right? Love for humankind, well, that means procreation of human beings. That means more scientific progress. That means more mouths to feed. And the reality is that, and, and, and this is the other, this is the catch as well. We live in a world of finite resources, right? O overarching that is a Malthusian idea, right? That the world is finite, resources are finite. And really it all comes down to the fact that unless we manage the numbers, right? They, they bring it down to math. I mean, there, it's, a, it's a lot like a, a sort of mathematician. It just comes down to the numbers. Look, there's this many resources. Um, I mean, the population is the, is the, is the issue, right? And so that's a, that's a big problem for a lot of people. So just saying love for mankind and all that, that doesn't really solve the problem. So, I mean, I think a lot of people are going to say that you sound very naive. Like this is just not, you're not talking about reality. You're not looking at the numbers. You're throwing around, you know, something you got from the Bible. And I think a lot of, pe a lot of people are like, well, I, we just don't care for it, right? We need to protect the environment at this point because there is a population problem. That's... So H.G. Wells is talking about this, right? The reason we're talking about this is that this isn't just fiction. We're not talking about entertainment, right? We're talking about art here, uh, storytelling, 
where ideas are being advanced, ideas are being developed, and entire worldviews are being shaped, mm-hmm. and people's worldviews are being acted on. Mm-hmm. So this is this is ser- this is serious art, and mm-hmm. I guess I I think part of the problem or what we're passionate about is getting people serious about art, mm-hmm. because I think a lot of people today, I mean, have this pop idea of popular art popular entertainment this well, is it's, it's 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 very understandable on the first hand if you look at where what hg wells went through as a kid on the one hand yeah uh you were just telling me a little bit uh before our interview you were telling me about what you had discovered about his own self-description of his own childhood and I'll read I think- the first paragraph from the intellectuals and the masses by john Kerry, which is a book that i would recommend to everybody it's about the 20th century literary intelligentsia and, and sort of that, the culture that, uh, you know, these people were in. Can you show the book cover for uh, on the camera? Can you see it? Yeah. The intellectuals and the masses. Okay. All right. I'm going to look at, I'm going to Google that. So the, the chapter is called H.G. Wells getting rid of people. H.G. <laughs> um, Wells was born in Bromley, Kent in 1866. It was just the wrong time to be born in Bromley. The railway had arrived in 1858 and the second station, Bromley North, was constructed when Wells was 12. With the railway came, quote unquote, development, which meant in this case, new estates of speculative housing for London commuters. Between 1861 and 1881, the population of Bromley went up from 20,000 to almost 50,000, a rate of increase four times the national average. And in the first 10 years of this period, the number of houses in Bromley rose by 86%. In his semi-autobiographical novel, The New Machiavelli, Wells recounts how, as a child, he had to watch Bromley being ruined. Quote, all my childish memories are of digging and wheeling, of woods invaded by building. I realized building was the enemy. End quote. Bromley's fields disappeared beneath rows of houses, its little river, the ravens born, the haunt of trout and kingfishers was filled with rubbish, quote, old iron, rusty cans, abandoned boots, end quote. It had, the narrator of the new Machiavelli recalls, been important in his imaginative life, the scene of early walks with his mother. By the time he was 11, quote, all the delight and beauty of it was destroyed, mm. end quote. This basic experience, as, as we said, I mean, this is shaping his outlook. And especially if we're speaking to people today, or people are hearing us talk today, it's probably their experience too. Yeah. So yeah. love for humankind. I mean, it's very easy to sort of, uh, I mean, what HG Wells is doing. I mean, he could do it a hundred years ago. So it, in a sense, there's a lot of problems. A lot of these problems are even more visible today for a lot more people. Yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, <clears throat> I think that that's really uh, vital because whenever you have, um, like, especially in the case of the industrial growth period of the uh, 19th century, that uh, it was really at a high point when H.G. Uh, Wells was a child growing up in the 1860s and 1870s. Um, what you did have is an overabundance in the zeitgeist, uh, whether it was of Europe or especially of the United States, of the idea, the faith in progress in humankind and the application of, pro- of, of science and technology in the form of bettering human life. Now, unfortunately, as we saw with the political economists like John Stuart Mill and, and, and uh, Malthus and Bentham and Smith of Britain, when it would be applied, the science of social engineering, uh, or some people called it political economy, British political economy, was Mm. extremely cold hearted, utilitarian and anti human. So there's, you know, the things that you see, uh, people like, um, um, uh, I mean, there, there, there's various stories. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Let me just uh, fix my camera there. That's a bit weird. I mean, I can still hear you. If it doesn't work, I'll keep going by audio. It, um, oh, there you go. Oh, there we are. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Sorry. <clears throat> so yeah. So what what you had with certain people 
who are writing stories like um, uh, David Copperfield or A Tale of Two Cities in Britain, they were showcasing a very disgusting uh, set of living standards ethics that really uh, were atrocious to nature. They were atrocious to human life. There was a lot of mm -hmm. child labor and abuse. Um, so the, let's just say the moral development of that society and its, and its leaders did not keep pace with the uh, scientific and technological development. So H.G. Wells probably saw some really ugly things in his life, and he probably saw some utilitarian applications of, of science technology in the small towns that he was uh, moving through. Now, unfortunately, it's how do you interpret them? Are you able to develop a differentiation in your, in your, in your internal compass when you're, when you're looking at these things and say, okay, is it mankind's fault? Is it because this is the expression, this destruction is the expression of our true essence? And that's why we cannot have technology because it will always be used for destructive purposes and burn down villages? Mm -hmm. Or is there a lack of wisdom and that our higher nature is would use this uh, properly um, and in a, in a loving way? That that differentiation was not there partially because you, you go to your mentors, right? Like you're developing your mind, your intellect, your your filters, um, through the school, through your, your social world as a child, you know, learning to be sovereign. And one of his unfortunate, he thought it, he was lucky, but in hindsight, I think we could say with a critical eye, he was very unfortunate that one of his early mentors was an individual at the normal school that he had a little scholarship for named uh, Thomas Huxley, mm. who took him under his wing and taught him that this is the actual expression of... Uh, of uh, human nature, that this worst aspect of what you see with your senses. Thomas Huxley is somebody who your reader, your viewers might know as Darwin's bulldog. He was the guy who was a major figure uh, at the Royal Society of, of Britain. Um, he's the one who manufactured all of the different debates uh, between super radical Anglican religious fundamentalists who believed in a literal interpretation of the, the Bible versus mm. um, the Darwinian um, people, usually himself. Yeah and uh, just annihilated, you know, he was able to annihilate all of their, their stupid debates in defense of, of you know, 6,000 years ago, everything just happened yeah, yeah. at once. Um, but he's also a, a political operator. He's a guy who's reorganizing the British Empire's grand strategy, working through an organization that people can Wikipedia right now. This is not a conspiracy called the X Club. The X Club was set up in 1865 um, in order specifically to gather together the leading figures of the different branches of, of British science who each represented, um, you know, chemistry, mathematics, astronomy, biology, and sort of unite them under one coherent set of uh, assumptions as a way to govern the political economy and geopolitical decisions of the empire as it proceeded into the last decades of the 19th century and into the first decades of the 20th century, um, which was you know, basically, this is an empire that was getting weak. It had it had spread itself thin. It had used a lot of its resources to try to snuff out rebellions in India, right. um, to 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 destroy China through opium and have wars on that. To fund a lot of money and weapons into the Confederacy of the South to try to spark the Civil War. Um, also, undermine Russia to try to you know th this is the British. Uh, a grand design to try to pull Russia into the Crimean Wars for several years that bankrupted and destroyed Russia in the 18 late 50s. So, you know, this is an empire that ha was unfortunately watching its grand designs fail as nations were increasingly adopting a, a mode of self organization based on uh, principles of full spectrum economics, protectionism, anti free trade policies that favored the development of their industrial and scientific growth, whether it was in Germany or whether it was in Japan with the Meiji Restoration or whether it was in uh, Reconstruction America, right? So this was spreading all over and even a lot of British um, leaders themselves were, were very much... Uh... Oh, that's uh, welcome to uh, the Brave New World. Uh, we yeah, have yeah, our... Brave New World is here. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that... uh, red alarm. Yeah, that was the uh, Quebec uh, warning for the curfew. Yeah, stay at home. You will. Be wow. Okay. Thousand dollar fines for leaving your house at this point. We're we're you. That's great. We're gonna use this. This is great. Okay. We just been warned we can't leave the house anymore. Or I mean, we have like an hour and a half. Beep beep. Get home on time because you're gonna get a fine, right? A big fine. 
Oh yeah. So, okay. I mean, this can play into, I, 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 I we'll work it in. We'll weave it in. It, it's very appropriate to what we're talking about, <laughs> but yeah, this is the thing. So the, the, the idea of a, of a, of a type of social order centered around Hobbesian, Malthusian, right. Darwinian uh, social organization under an empire was antagonistic to the idea of a multipolar world of sovereign nation states cooperating, developing their people's creative potentials, um, and forcing the monetary systems as well to behave according to the future needs of that society's growth. There were two very antagonistic paradigms. Right. Um, and that's what H.G. Wells's teacher, Thomas Huxley, was right. completely committed to um, snuffing out. He was, he, was, he was representing the need to help reorganize the British Empire so that it could snuff out these little fires, these Promethean fires around the world okay. that were spreading. Okay. Um, yeah. And, okay. and H.G. Wells happened to come up with a very unique and innovative um, uh, strategy for utilizing fiction in such a way that you could act upon something more deep than the, the simple uh, conscious intellectual level um, of the victim populations you wanted to weaken and subvert over a longer patient period of time than uh, many imperialists at the time were willing to do. He was very... Right. Oh my goodness. I mean, there's a lot of things that uh, this provokes. A lot of thoughts are provoked within me uh, as I hear you. I mean, th there are several things I want to bring up here. Um, first off, I mean, okay, Wells is saying, and uh, okay, first, this is serious art. I mean, this is serious. These are serious ideas in just a you know a, a, a little fiction book, and I think it's it's worth it. Uh, it's kind of humbling to see that like some of the biggest ideas shaping the history of humanity. This is this is the domain in which they're being generated. This is the domain in which they're being born. Right? There's a dialogue across history. This uh, between different authors, different thinkers, mm -hmm. different poets. Mm -hmm. So this isn't a joke mm. ultimately <laughs> no it's not a joke ultimately i mean these are the ideas that are going to shape society the idea if you look at dante's commedia right and how this shape this idea when when human when dante looks into the light right at, at its brightest point mm. right when he can look no further into the light what does he see he sees an image of his own face. He sees the image of a human face, right? So at the brightest level, right? Knowledge of the, the creative principle animating the universe, right? The creator is itself a reflection of the human creative uh, personality, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, Wells is looking at this and I mean, He's not making fire look very good, right? Promethean fire, he's, but the, what's very fascinating, he's ex recognizing, he's saying the principle of fire, it's real. This is the real, this is a real deal. And if we're going to have, you're talking about empire and stuff. And I mean, he was a part of not only the, the X club, but the coefficients club, right? A dinner club that's sort of, they're all talking about, you know, the fading of the, the British Empire as this global, you know, military shipping, uh, naval power and all that. And they're talking about how, you know, like, how do you resolve this? Right. So when he's talking about the question of fire, right. And basically that you can't, there is fire, but we have to get people to believe fervently that we must limit knowledge of fire. Knowledge of fire is not something that we can just let sort of go free. Mm -hmm. The world set free mm -hmm. because this is nuclear war. This yep. is all these things. This is humanity. Sure, progress. Everybody's in love. They have love for mankind, for womankind, and the population. One giant will, loving orgy. <laughs> the population will just balloon. So, yeah. I mean, H.G. Wells is ultimately making the, the, uh, 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 an oligarchical uh, argument, right? That you need to have a small class that really regulates this stuff because human beings, yes, they have this knowledge of fire. Yes, they all love each other, but that's, look at what it actually looks like. Mm -hmm. right? And he plays around with this theme and in many very imaginative 
and creative ways. And there's a lot today in the world as well. If we're just operating based on our senses, there's a lot of evidence empirically to suggest that that could be the case. Mm -hmm. But just because something looks a certain way, yeah. just because the world appears a certain way, does that really mean it is that way? Yes. Right. And I think this is the whole point of artistic insight, yep. right? It's going beyond just our immediate perception of the world yep. and recognizing that there are higher principles, higher ideas shaping that. Yep. And we see this in Wells, you know, he calls it the, the shape of things to come, yep. the open conspiracy. Yep. You know, he has an answer in as nonfiction, right? His answer to his fiction is in his nonfiction yep. where he really lays out and I think it's important because a lot of people will sympathize, I think, with the image of human nature that he's laid out. And I think a lot of more cynical people may feel like what you're propounding is, is somewhat idealistic and naive. Yeah. But, okay, but hang on. H.G. Wells is a solution. So you don't, I mean, you don't like fire. You think we need to control knowledge of fire. Knowledge of fire is dangerous. Okay, get ready for the solution. I mean, do you want to, do you, do you want to maybe talk about that? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, people I mean, have to be ready if, right. they're serious, if they're that's... serious about the problem, yeah. like H.G. Wells is serious about the problem. Well, you know, they need to be ready for the solution. So, yeah, exactly. And I, I think that the, the, sometimes if, um, if the victims aren't causing the problem, you have to make the problem happen so that you could teach them that. The, there were the there was the problem there and and one of the one of the if you want people to learn that fire is bad for them you might get frustrated when they're not actually burning down their houses to be afraid of fire mm. um you might have to go and help them discover what you think they should discover by yeah. burning down their houses for them <laughs> when they're asleep right and, and that way they'll learn the lesson that they should be learning um i think that that's sort of the same thing when you look at um we are told and given certain popular narratives to explain how things like, let's say, the Vietnam War happened or how and why World War II or I happened. Um, but when you start poking them and scrutinizing these popular explanations, you know, like, for example, we're told, well, World Wars I and World War II happened because that's sovereign nation states being selfish and wanting more territory, wanting more power, and that ultimately you know, if we didn't have sovereign nation states and we just had world government properly uh, in place, it, this never would have been allowed to happen. Now, the question is, is that true? Um, well, that's certainly the lesson that, you know, H.G. Wells is getting across in his World Set Free in 1914 or in his uh, uh, Things to Come in, in 1933, which people right. can watch the uh, Alexander Korda movie um, on YouTube for free. It's really worth it. Uh, it's a little hour and a half, two hours where, you know, he really gets across that, uh, sovereign nation states are what is causing and keeping human beings fighting each other going into dark ages pandemics for generations right just to make this up because okay sovereign nations and i i think because a lot of people will say okay well you know we have to have rules we have to da, da, da. but the point is and h.g wells is making the point well who's to say the sovereign nations are going to listen like the whole point of a sovereign nation is their sovereign yeah. Like, is China really going to accept? Well, but you know, but just just to just to say quickly, yeah, I agree. But but the thing that really you have to realize when you start poking it, uh, poking at these narrative and these models that were given, is that these were all artificial wars. The the running of the assassinations of mm -hmm. Archduke Ferdinand through an anarchist cell, the Black Hand in Serbia. Um, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of literature pointing out and proving how these were not just self organically created, self organized anarchist groups. These were uh, deployed by figures like Prince Pr uh, Kr Krotopkin, um, who was based out of Britain, who was working very closely uh, with networks like em Emma Goldman, Goldman, who ended up running the assassination of McKinley also. Um, a lot of these things are manipulated by figures behind the scenes who are often the same ones proposing the solutions of the League of Nations to solve the problems of World War I, um, which... Of course, H.G. Wells was a major integral part of that solution campaign in 1919, 1920, 21, or in the case right. of uh, World War II. Like the fact that it's provably the case that major industrial and financial powers of London and of the U.S. establishment were pouring money throughout the 30s into the coffers of fascism, both Mussolini as well as Hitler. That if that if they didn't do that, did you have to get the war? 
No, Nazism was going bankrupt by 33. They, right. were, they were kept afloat and growing by the support of these uh, imperial networks. So what's up with that? Did the World War II right. have to happen if they didn't? Right. No, yeah. right? Yeah, so is it really the sovereign nations that are just killing each other and all yeah, that? It's a little simplistic. Yeah, mm. right. That's I mean, that's a big theme in Wells' literature, right? The sovereign nation, that's, that's the, the solution is world government. Mm -hmm. uh, or the world state, right, in one way or another. Yep. And, and I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people are, I mean, there's a lot of talk about conspiracy today, right? People are freaking out about uh, all sorts of conspiracies. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting, you know, I mean, in Wells's case, it's like he's not just a fiction writer, right? He He's actually involved in the intellectual circles that are sort of laying out what a blueprint, this is what the open conspiracy is, right? What is a blueprint for a new world state, which is premised on the, you know, abolishment of nations? So, I mean, I think, I, I think the point is that we have to take, we have to look at the bigger picture. Like, we can't just take this random story that Wells wrote and be like, oh, how, you know, fascinating that is, right? There's a context Yep. And it's, a, it's the same with a lot of these writers that people just treat as sort of literary figures like Algis Huxley. Like the Brave New World is not just some, you know, imagined uh, dystopia. Or I mean, people are saying he's warning about it, but he's really laying out a lot of, I mean, the kind of things that we see today that keep a lot of people from, I mean, feeling the need to actually fight for knowledge of fire, mm -hmm. for example, right? Instead, there's entertainment. Um, I mean, there's Soma, right? There's synthetic music. There's a massive availability of, uh, you know, uh, what do we call it? Like uh, uh, inconsequential uh, sex or, or, I mean, just, uh, you know, no strings attached, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So there are all these things. And it's like, are you really going to, you know, start, pick a fight with like someone much bigger than you, like a Zeusian, mm -hmm. Zeusian crowd to fight for knowledge of fire. Are you really going to put yourself through all that trouble? And I mean, you have your friends, you have your family to take care of. So why fight for knowledge of fire? And I mean, then HG Wells is saying, well, we should just control it. And, you know, then they're, that that's his take and then there won't be these problems right as i but as you said those are are false the way he's framed the problems are not really the problem yes but um yeah i mean why fight for knowledge of fire it becomes exactly I'm, I'm so happy that you brought up all this huxley as well in this thing because if you uh, keep in mind these guys all this huxley is the grandson of hg wells's teacher thomas huxley right H.G. Wells is working super closely throughout his life with, and, and Thomas Huxley passed on his word at worst attributes to his children, Leonard Huxley, who ran the Eugenics Society of Britain, to his grandkids, Aldous and Julian, whose lives right. were each devoted to eugenics. Uh, Julian was the uh, vice president of the British Eugenics Society for many, many years. Um, even after he, even while he was setting up UNESCO uh, in 46, he was still saying that eugenics is the most important social science. Um, they were right. all working very closely with H.G. H. Wells and, you know, Aldous Huxley. Yeah. When you look at, for example, uh, his open conspiracy, uh, sorry, his, uh, sorry, his ultimate revolution um, speech Lecture. right before he dies, his ultimate revolution speech is a take from H.G. Wells's story, The Shape of Things to Come from 1933, the, which was subtitled The Ultimate Revolution. Um, and in it, they're going through, if you want to get into the psyche, the psychological state of an oligarch or at least an upper upper managerial sort of, uh, right, uh, uh, what do you call it, courtier, a courtier of the of the empire, like these guys are, um, read these books, read Brave New World, and the chapter that has the dialogue between Mustafa Mond, the uh, higher level sort of Wellsian social engineer um, in that future society of world government, and John Savage, the Promethean figure type right, who loves Shakespeare, and he loves creativity, he loves freedom, and he finally finds himself face to face with this figure who once describes himself in this dialogue as I was just like you, I loved creativity, and I love I saw myself as a biologist, and I wanted to make discoveries in the field of science and solve problems. And then I realized the problem I was educated. Um, and I had a choice. Um, 
because I was I was told either I would be sent to the island, you know, because my ideas were going to be dangerous, or I could become part of the the inner elite. And I, I chose the wise decision to be a part of this. And he goes through in this dialogue why it is that certain writings of Shakespeare, why Shakespeare has to be banned, why other other uh, classical writings have to be banned from society. And he goes through why creative discoveries themselves are dangerous because they're not controllable. They're not known. And what is not known is dangerous because it causes instability. And in this paradigm, instability is the greatest of all evils. Stability, yeah. no, states of no change where everybody knows their place in a caste system of social, of crystallized social ordering is good. That is the maximum good. So you see how their entire rewire a natural, loving, creative state of being into something totally crystallized and unnatural. And John Savage is completely incapable of defending his case. He ends up breaking down. And that is what Aldous Huxley, who's usually using H.G. Wells' insights in, uh, in fiction writing, that's, right. that's the lesson he wants people to walk away from, even though people think of both Wells or Aldous Huxley as great minds who are warning of the future that is coming to being today. No, the future, the future that's coming into being today is made possible because of the type of social engineering that was done on the zeitgeist and people's imagination on that deeper subconscious level over generations that made it more, made us more mushy, made us more capable of adapting rather than resisting these unnatural political changes that befell us in the course of Vietnam War, assassinations of John F. Kennedy, other people who we should have, you know, arisen as, as a people morally to say this is wrong. We shouldn't be taking this other new direction. We should be, you know, that didn't happen. Why? Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say there, but uh, again, this, this, I mean, knowledge of fire is made to look bad and dangerous. And I mean, today it's like you have uh, rogue nations that, you know, can develop the knowledge of nuclear weapons and stuff. Like that's still a real thing that's being, you know, played out. Mm -hmm. And, but I mean, Wells, Huxley, these types, I think they're really laying out what people have to recognize as its own thing is an oligarchical outlook, yep. right? It's a very misanthropic and Zeusian idea of human beings. And I think it's important. I mean, I have a quote here and again, this is from the intellectuals in the masses, mm. like when people like HD Wells and these types are talking about, population control and freedom and happiness among all peoples. I mean, it also involves things like massive eugenics programs, right? It, at a selective breeding. And it's actually, uh, they're also very racist at heart, uh, which I think with a lot of uh, today, like it should especially make people uh, with all the consciousness and awareness of uh, different, you know, cultural and societal problems and yet these, these guys are given a free pass, even though they're, they have some of the most uh, hideous um, views. And just to give an example, um, so Wells is talking about the, the, the population problem, but here's how he actually sees it. So, I mean, a lot of people agree and, and they're Wells and these types propose all sorts of solutions, but here's what they actually, they, they really think directly. So in the book, it says he, Wells, realized, of course, that the population problem was even more acute outside Europe. In The Open Conspiracy, the book which he offered as a plain statement of his essential ideas, the profligate fertility and, quote, inchoate barbarism, end quote, of the inhabitants of the Orient and Africa are seen as obstacles to any hu real human progress. In India, North Africa, China, and the Far East, Wells regretfully reports, quote, there goes on a rapid increase of low-grade population, undersized physically and mentally, and retarding the mechanical development of civilization, end quote. In these, quote, decadent communities outside the Atlantic capitalist system, end quote, almost no intelligences would be found, he predicted, capable of grasping his plans for world improvement. And so this is in his... Um, anticipations of the reaction of mechanical and scientific progress mm -hmm. upon human life and thought. Mm -hmm. I mean, Wells, as all the British imperialists did, saw the populations of China, the darker skin, you know, Africans or Middle Easterns, their very existence was a problem. 
and the fact that they had their own uh, you know, social, cultural, and religious systems was a problem. Uh, and it was in their way, right? Because ultimately, if you want to solve the population problem, I mean, it won't work if you impose it on your own sort of nations, but the whole outside world is not following. Hence world government, right? Hence a world state. And so, I mean, a lot of things that kind of sound like compelling um, assessments of the problem and solutions when you actually take a closer look. And I mean, that's the point with art, like there's nuance there. You yeah. want people to actually get in there and see that this is actually a very, this is the quintessential oligarchical outlook. You know, it's based on Darwinian sort of, you know, there's genetic superiority among peoples, right? There's high breeding and there's low breeding. And ultimately he says, um, I mean, this is shocking. So I, I feel like, mm. uh, Right, in his, um, this, when the sleeper wakes, all over, he, all over the world, he observes and anticipations, he wells, published in 1901, quote, vicious, helpless, and pauper masses, end quote, have appeared, spreading as the railway systems have spread and representing an integral part of the process of industrialization, like the waste product of a healthy organism. Mm -mm -mm. These, quote, great useless masses of people, end quote, he adopts the term, quote, people of the abyss, end quote, and he predicts that, quote, the nation that most resolutely picks over, educates, sterilizes, exports, or poisons its people of the abyss, end quote, will be in the ascendant. That's so sick. I mean, this is what ha this is what actually takes over in, in Germany, right? In the 1930s, like the, the idea of race science and eugenics that Wells is actually outlining in a lot of his fiction books, yeah. right? Even if you look at something like the time machine uh, that we began with, that there are these different classes that are just intrinsically different yeah. and any smart uh, governing uh, body will make sure that you don't let the the lower breeds sort of get out of control or just they can't have freedom basically you can't you know, allow I was them thinking about as you're talking and it's so horrific but a lot of people would probably um see a contradiction in what's what, what's being said now and what i had said earlier about plato self-describing himself as a promethean and how his character socrates was was going about um, helping people distinguish what is a, a, a fertile question versus an infertile one or a real thought versus a wind egg. Um, and, and they would say, oh, but, you know, H.G. Wells was a self-professed pl pl uh, Platonist. He even says, and I was reading one of these quotes where he says, these thoughts of mine on world government and population control and all selective breeding, they're not, they're not new. It's not just me. These, this is pure Plato. Uh, just right. read, read The Republic. And it's like, yeah, if you read the Republic from the standpoint of an oligarch who is a literalist and you're just reading the literal words, it will appear as though Plato is advocating this sort of Spartan society um, of very top-down controlled um, tyranny um, that that uh, Wells is, is talking about or, or Aldous Huxley. They, it would seem as though this is a modern-day technocratic version of the Republic. Mm. Now, if you if you actually look at what Plato is doing as a self-professed Promethean, which he, you know, in all of his writings, he's educating you about how false, how we generate an assumption to solve a problem, a paradox, and how do we test out the assumption? Where does it lead us? What are the natural consequences? Right. The series of questions that takes you to conclusions. So even seeming as, as, assumptions, which seemed legitimate, like when Plato says, well, if we're trying to, you know, in the Republic, when he says, well, okay, we're trying to figure out how do we create justice in a society? Well, how do we train the leaders of the society, the guardians? How do we, how do we do that? And, you know, a hypothesis is introduced. Well, how do we, how do we train uh, better animals, better attack dogs, guard dogs? Isn't this, this the same thing? And the character is like, yes, of course, it's the same thing. I guess so. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Based on that assumption being accepted, where does it take you? If you're saying that we're going to model our educational program on similar principles that we model our natural selective breeding of our guard dogs to mm. 
where will that lead you in terms of the political application of that over time, right? Yeah. Um, if you're, and so Socrates is taking you through exercises to strengthen your mind and your critical thinking and to identify and smell out paradoxes and ironies mm -hmm. so that you can, you know, where, and, and that's not a lesson that people in the oligarchical class wanted to learn. They just liked the form of, oh yeah, that's a great, that's a great way to, to do yeah, it, yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> you package it as your own. Uh... Yeah, and they were doing it anyway that way. That, that's not Plato like coming up with a new system. That's already the way it was done. It was just that Plato was exposing how Spartan societies and how the oligarchical societies already self-organized with the cult under, under cults like at Delphi, um, which he pokes fun at in some, some of his dialogues. Um, when right. he says, you know, we have to get permission from, from the priestess at Delphi, from the priests uh, of, of Apollo at Delphi to, uh, to do this, right? And they're like, oh, yes, of course we do. It's like, whoa, who, most people didn't realize that their leaders oh. were going to ask permission. <laughs> right. um, that's very similar to the types of, of ways that the, the bodies of experts that are above government anonymous, that are trying to manage the system from above, and that hate nation states, because nation states blossomed out of the Renaissance, right? That if you look at where they came from, modern nation states arose uh, as, a, as something which were created by people to defend ourselves, to create a power structure sufficient to, to, to defend ourselves from the evils of empire that always existed for thousands of years and mm -hmm. create and establish positive laws based upon the principles of natural law and of justice, that all people are endowed with certain inalienable rights, that, that, laws, that, that the legitimacy of law is, comes from the consent of the governed and the welfare of the people. That's that's straight out of Dante. I, you know, you see that in his De Monarchia, you could see it in Cusa. Um, it's there. And that's what what was born and what what would what advanced all the way through the American Revolution. And that's what the Empire wants to snuff out. And that's why they're afraid today of things like, you know, nation states that can protect their people from an oncoming, let's say, a mel an economic meltdown that might happen where pe people will be you know, nations will be forced to choose. Do we protect the private banks that we've already been bailing out for decades or do we protect the people? Which that, that choice might become more clear. There's too many people, right? There, there's, there's the rub though, right? There, there, there's an understanding or there, the assumption is that there's too many people, right? That's, that's being woven into the, the, the binary choice that you're allowed you, to make. You wanna hear something, something horrific on the Great Reset uh, website you know, because some of these uh, billionaires running in uh, Europe right now who've been promoting an, an idea of like a, a reset of the world economy. A very Wellsian idea. Very, very Wellsian idea. They're saying it's, it's actually not such a bad thing. I was reading one of their blogs and uh, Klaus Schwab was saying, um, you know, actually the COVID shutdown of the economy has actually got more bright spots than bad spots because world uh, carbon dioxide output has gone down 7%, which is great for nature. And that's actually a greater good than all of the harm we've done to the economy and to people. So maybe we should actually do more of this for longer. That's actually something that he openly said, right? right. People are actually, they're so misanthropic. They've been induced to, to take on such a, they haven't thought to take well, on a, a non-human or anti-human or a hate for in, dirty industry as part of the cultural ethic that they were born into and got in school and in their media yeah. and in their, in their movies that they're very susceptible to say, oh, I guess he's right. Yeah, maybe well, it's not such a bad thing. Hang on, but just to just to, to to nuance that as well. Well, the point is that the because you said they're destroying the economy, and I mean that gets thrown in all sorts of different ways, and people have all sorts of different assumptions uh, about what's meant by economy. But when it's saying the 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 you Carbon know dioxide. the shutdown or whatever is uh, is good, you know the skies are clearer now because there's no planes. Which is and so the skies are more beautiful. Fewer, fewer, fewer and, yeah. Yeah, like you know, there's the nature sort of getting a bit of a like uh, a respite from all the the human hullabaloo. But the assumption of what the economy is is a very Wellsian sort of oligarchical idea of uh, of, of what Wells describes as you know this kind of dirtying, uh, you know, fetish for progress, human progress fetish. And so it's not really Promethean, right? It's not actually because something that's Promethean is not going to want to destroy the environment, right? That, that human beings live in. So there, there's all sorts of assumptions built in yeah. just to say. And um, I, I just as that maybe to, to close, I mean, on an interesting, on a fun note, I mean, because Wells likes to go into the future 
into the past. And so, I mean, if we go into the future from where Wells was, and I mean, and we look at fiction today, right? If we look at a lot of the, I, I, I was kind of taken aback once I realized what I'm constantly being uh, exposed to on Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime and these things. I always go back to that, but it's very fascinating. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, not only social engineering, but human trans humanism, right? A lot of this sci-fi. Oh, you know, who invented, you know, who invented the word, the term transhumanism. Is it like Wells? Close. It's Julian Huxley. Right. He's the guy who coined the term. Yeah. As a, as a new so brand. Of eugenics. Yeah. One of the vanguards of, uh, you know, eugenics policy uh, right after uh, World War II. Yeah. Right. The, as the director of uh, UNESCO. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of this sort of uh, improved genetic modification of human beings. There's this show, uh, Anna, that I saw on Amazon Prime, like making more superior and efficient human beings based on genetic modification, based on, you know, AI, you know, uh, all sorts of technological implants and stuff. And it, um, I mean, it's very, there are a lot of assumptions there. I mean, the idea of knowledge of fire, Promethean fire of creativity, it's not really how can we improve, a help develop this innate creative fire within human beings. It's all about bringing in basically what is, you know, uh, you know, uh, selective breeding sort of themes and genetic breeding and, uh, you know, advanced technological implants and all sorts of things that are meant like, as if, is that really going to answer the kind of problems that are actually, um, you know, existing, right? So it's making, it's sort of, it's what it's, it's what's not said in a lot of this fiction. Um, I mean, I find a lot of it is in a sense, Wellsian. it's not like I'm saying it, it's, it's directly related, but there's that same sort of spirit of there's these kind of um, dystopias being painted for us. Yeah, maybe we should just appreciate it for that. Like this idea of a dystopia and sort of there's always the kind of, we're painting all these dark images of human nature. Yeah. But then there are these real world solutions, these nonfiction solutions that are actually being presented, yeah. which become way more uh, thinkable. Yeah which is actually, I mean, what Julian Huxley and, and some of these folks were talking about, that eugenics should become thinkable in that this is just improvement of, you know, human biology and uh, anatomy. And this is just part of, you know, certain people have a, uh, you know, predisposition for creative activity and some yeah, yeah. don't. Yeah, yeah. And so you start and they're, they get at it from this point of heredity. Yeah. So yeah. all we're doing is really trying to improve human beings and how the human society functions. Yeah. I mean, this is how eugenics was sold before it became a... Absolutely. No, no, absolutely. It's, That's it's, all it was. It's it's helping evolution yeah, yeah. move forward. Yeah. And ironically, like if you actually define people in a Promethean way as being a creature of creative genius of love as our natural state, that spiritual intellectual side is primary to the material flesh and the fleshly passions. If that's right. if that's your idea of humankind, then in that world, you can say, OK, we are as a self-consciously uh, reasoning species capable in, in a certain way, um, charting out uh, the evolution of the biosphere, we can maybe do things that m make things better for even the flows of nature and the cycles of nature that we discover and apply to green a desert or to, uh, let's say, for example, uh, oranges, apples. These things are not things that just occurred in nature by themselves. Uh, they are things that were selectively bred for uh, basic reasons, right, for nutritional and taste value over human time. And uh, we call them, you know, we, we take it for granted that that's where an apple comes from or like, you know, um, even, you know, your, your domesticated uh, friend, the dog, you know, if you go back a, a million yeah. years, that dog was going to rip out your throat. You did not want one of those in your house uh, right. or the bobcat, you know, that would have like killed your baby. Now it's just a, this cute thing. That's, you know, yeah. You just had a fat cat in the background chair right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, 
human beings in a sense already by virtue of decision, thought, judgment, all already influencing the flow of evolution. And if you are governed by a, a loving creative society that praises knowledge and its application justly in society, then you can sort of imagine that um, we could do this in, an, in, an, in a lawful way that's in tune with the laws of the universe. And I think that there's some uh, fiction that is even today alive, which awakens that even now, like that Jules Verne type of optimism, the reasonable optimism I was telling right. you about. And there's examples that people can find. It's not all bad, even though uh, Hollywood and, and Netflix are contaminated with a lot of this. You know, I, I, I tell people a lot of times that, you know, they could watch, for example, these anom anomalous movies that, that do awaken this in various degrees, like The Martian with Matt Damon from 2015. Wonderful mm -hmm. movie of human creativity in a, in a, in a problem-solving situation that's impossible on Mars. And uh, this person has to awaken uh, certain characteristics of strength and creativity and hope within themselves that have practical application that keeps them alive. And it's like Robinson Crusoe from Daniel Defoe 400 years ago. It's the same sort of moralizing effect or Interstellar where, you know, one of the lessons of Interstellar uh, with Matthew McConaughey, again, not, a, not that long ago, is that love is built into the fabric of, of the scientific universe. It's not just these cold calculating things. That's, that's something which is there in the movie. Um, and it's a part of the, the, the celebration of the human spirit and mind to overcome the impossible. On, or I'd say even more recently, there's a Chinese movie that's the acting is a little bit weak, but it's a good coming from the right place called The Wandering Earth, where Earth in some d distant future is all of a sudden finding itself um, on the verge of getting eaten up by a, by a supernova, by the sun going supernova faster than we realized. And the world has to start working together to overcome this problem. And I'll let people watch it, but it involves some serious cherishing of the human spirit. That's Wandering Earth, Chinese movie. Again, acting, they have, they've got a lot to learn in, in terms of nuance and complexity of, of acting, but regardless, it's the right idea. So yeah. that's, that's to say the power of, of, of fiction and of, of the arts and literature and cinema is very strong to, in terms of reversing the negative influences of misanthropy that have been put there uh, by all of this predictive programming for generations. It can be done very quickly and it's because it's so natural. I, I listened to discussions of young people who were in their 20s, uh, you know, going through the, the same sort of, oh, I lost my picture. That's okay, I'm listening. It'll come back. Um, but these people were going through the same sort of conditioning for years and years in their schools of mankind is a, is a cancer to mother Gaia nature. And, but right. listening to the discussions in the washrooms and stuff of all of these excited young people after the Martian was done, um, they were all just enthralled. They, they were saying, I never thought of human beings this way. I never thought of space this way. And they were excited about NASA and, and doing these things that they were normally never excited about. And that was only a two hour movie. Right. right. So, all that to say, the, the artists do have a great responsibility uh, for society and their power to change things more than I think people realize, more than even an economist or a politician. Yeah, I mean, I think you've made a good point. And I mean, this is kind of a, a the responsibility of the arts is very great. And I mean, even if a lot of some of the things I mean, I think because for our listeners, right, there's a cynicism. So you're talking about love for humanity and all that. And I feel like emotionally people are still going to struggle with that. However, you try and square it because we're in a world that is full of all sorts of, you know, complex issues. And there's a lot of things in our immediate perception of the world, which can suggest that, you know, things, human beings aren't as good as, you know, they might, they, they some people say they are that, you know, ultimately there is this Wellesian test it out. Test it out. Yeah. Ultimately the moral law, you know, yeah. the duality is still there and sure things may look good at a certain degree, but ultimately human nature comes back, reverts to this thing. But just to say, my point is that we should just sort of appreciate the fact that having discussed Wells's approach to fiction and the kind of ideas about human nature that he's actually uh, playing with or, or, or playing with as themes, mm -hmm are saturated with an oligarchical sort of outlook on human nature any way you square it um knowledge of fire is not seen as that good it's seen as pretty dangerous and a lot of people are scared mm -hmm. and i mean i think that that was the that's that's the whole point that if zeus can't directly deny knowledge of fire to humankind right if there's there's people willing to fight for it um 
in a, in a world of, of, of free thought and free speech, uh, the only way that Zeus can still prevail is if they can manage, succeed in making fire look bad enough that people are like, yeah, you know what? I don't think it's worth the trouble. You know, I have Soma. I have Amazon Prime. I'm going to live my best life. And yeah, so it doesn't seem like it's worth the trouble, but it's to appreciate there's a lot that goes into building up that perception of the world and we're actually bombarded with it. Yeah. And I mean, so I think it's, it's worth sort of leaving listeners with the question, you know, is fire really worth, is knowledge of fire really worth fighting for? That's good. No. Is it worth, yeah, test well, it out. Test out your hypothesis. If, if, if human beings are really as bad as you think they are and, and that fire is as dangerous or nuclear power is as dangerous as uh, you believe it is, test it out. See if what we've been saying in the last two hours is true or can it be disproven? Prove, work it out. I think that's great. I love that challenge. Uh, so I want to thank you, Matthew, for, for coming back and gracing us with your, uh, your presence and all these fun ideas. And I want to thank everybody for listening. So we'll be back next week. Thanks, Thanks for listening.